Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to coverage of my uh, round four game from the Pacific Coast Open. I had the black pieces. Um, my opponent here had a rating of uh, 1731 and my rating for this tournament was uh, 1844. So he kicked off with uh, d4, went knight f6, c4, e6. So I'm looking to play the uh, Nimzo Indian if I get a chance and um, or something else if he plays knight to uh, knight to f three and avoids the Nimzo, then I can I can play a variety of different systems. But uh, I, I like to play the Nimzo if I get the chance. Um, he played a, a rare move here. He played bishop g5. And actually, I had seen this in uh, in a recent uh, Blitz game. And so I, I'd actually uh, had this position before. And I played bishop e7 in the Blitz game, and I looked it up afterwards, and it seems like this is a fine response. I mean, it's pretty logical. You're just uh, unpinning. And then the blitz game continued with uh, knight to c3, and I played this funny uh, knight to d5 tactic, defending the bishop and uh, trading off against the knight on c3. Anyway, my opponent didn't play knight c3 here. He played knight to f3. And so we're just out of uh, any any kind of understanding of what might be going on here that I have. Although um, I can always play d5 at this point and just transpose back into a queen's gambit decline. But, uh, well, I didn't do that. I, I was okay with uh, being in uh, unknown territory. And I think this position is really about even. Uh, you know, white has given up the opening advantage. But, uh, well, white's got a position which is not in the opening books. And, uh, you know, maybe white has some more experience with this position than his opponent. I've only seen this once before. Actually, I've never seen this position before because the only other time I faced this opening uh, that they played, uh, my opponent played uh, knight to c3. Um, <clears throat> so here, once again, I could play d5 and go into a queen's gambit decline type of position, but I went with uh, c5. I thought this might be an interesting way to play. Um, you know, if he takes, then uh, I'll take back with the bishop. And um, if he pushes, then actually I win a pawn here. I can take and take and grab a pawn, or he could, uh, he could try grabbing my knight first and then pushing the pawn forward. But in that case, uh, I will have the, the bishop pair's compensation on the bishop. Actually, even that doesn't work because the bishop will be on this uh, diagonal looking at the loose b pawn. So um, <clears throat> so he can't really do anything about the d pawn, but uh, he just ignores that and plays knight to c3, which is a good response. So now I take. It's often the idea of putting the, the c pawn forward as you trade your wing pawn for a center pawn, and then he takes knight takes d4. And here I was a little bit worried about his knight hopping into the, um, the b5 square, so I played the move um, a6. And, uh, you know, I was kind of looking at this position, trying to figure out what uh, what it resembles, and it um, it's kind of looks like a uh, Sicilian defense, actually. This uh, pawn set up here you see in the con Sicilian for example um, looks like a Sicilian defense where um, where white forgot to play e4 <laughs> so I was sort of thinking about it uh, that way and uh, and as I was thinking about it my opponent played uh, f3 and I said aha uh -huh. he is he's preparing to play e4 he's gonna go for something like a uh, Meroxy bind setup so um, you know I thought that was that was interesting um, I don't Often, you know, I, when I play the Sicilian, I don't often play against the Meroxy bind. But, uh, well, the times I have, it, it, I haven't had too much trouble with it. But usually I play lines that avoid the Meroxy bind. So I don't have a whole lot of experience on the black side against the Meroxy. I guess I would have, have been learning how to play the white side of the Meroxy, and I, I would be happier with that. Anyway, I played knight c6. Um, and he didn't go e4 immediately. He went uh, bishop to f2. I castled. Now he goes e4. And we've got this kind of setup. And um, here I make a slight mistake. Um, I was thinking about this position for quite a while. There's, there's a couple of different plans that I could consider here. Um, and the first one I thought about was d5. And I think d5 is the top choice of the chess engine. So it's probably probably the best move here. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing is, you, you play d5 and you can get away with it, I guess. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Um, because you're kind of busting up the center, opening things up. And he hasn't castled yet, so opening things up maybe favors black a little bit. Um, 
I guess what I didn't like was this line. He would take, I would take, he would take, um, and I take. Can't take with the queen because his knight's on that. And then he could take here. And we get this kind of position. I mean, it's true I have this edge in development because he hasn't castled yet. But I didn't see any um, big way to exploit that. And, uh, and my pawn structure has been weakened a little bit. So, um, so actually white seems to have come out of that okay. Um, but, well, when I, when I put this on the chess engine, the chess engine uh, continued the line. It didn't stop here in its evaluation. This is about as far ahead as I evaluated during the game. It said, um, no, black is still better because, for example, in this line, say bishop to c4, you know, white wants to develop a bishop uh, so that he can castle, put some pressure on the center. Say I defend with bishop e6. This bishop can drop back to uh, b3 to get away from any discoveries. Also, you know, I had this rook b8 idea um, hitting hitting the loose b pawn there. Um, so now that pawn is shielded. Um, but now that's bought me a little bit of time. I can trade off here and then trade off here and play bishop to f6. And, uh, and the chess engine likes this position for black, um, I guess because of the, uh, the pressure that I get on the c-pawn. Now, although it seems like white can defend it. <clears throat> but, uh, well, that pawn is pen. Maybe I can add to the pressure in some way. Um, okay, but that's, so that's the chess engine evaluation. Um, likes that d5 move. I mean, the other reason, let's go back to the end. The other reason I didn't really want to open it up like this is this um, position might be kind of drawish in a way. Um, you know, the queens could come off, and then he's not, not going to be in any, in any trouble. White won't be in any trouble from the lack of castling. And uh, or or you could trade queens and then castle, but that would lose a pawn. So I guess uh, maybe it's not so simple for white to get out of the trouble. But you know, <clears throat> when you're looking ahead that far in your calculation from this position to uh, a position that's uh, um, what was that? That was seven moves ahead. That's that's pretty long distance calculation. And I only looked about four moves ahead, I guess. Um, <clears throat> You know, it just seemed like the position kind of opened up without any clear advantage to black. Maybe, actually, I thought uh, white would have some advantage playing against my um, my weakened pawn structure. And so, yeah, I just didn't like that move. And, yeah, I didn't want to open things up too quickly and get to a position where white could just trade everything off and go for a draw. You know, I really am trying to uh, play for a win here. Uh, the second idea I had in this position was uh, knight to e5. And, uh, well, I didn't like that particularly because after knight e5, he could play f4. Although it turns out this is one of those positions. <laughs> I had another one of these in a blitz game recently. This is one of those positions where knight e to g4 is playable. Um, I guess because it's got a target here on, uh, on f2 to play against. So, um, so this is uh, okay for black as well. Anyway, both those lines are either at least equal or, or better for black. So black is really doing fine in this position. But uh, after the move I played, I played knight takes d4. And he took back with the queen. And actually that changes the uh, character, <coughs> or it changes the evaluation. I don't know if it really changes the character. It changes the evaluation of the position to, uh, to better for white. So, so that's actually a, a slight mistake. Slight but noticeable, I guess. Um, you know, it's not like a, a game losing mistake, but, but it made a noticeable difference in the game. And, um, and what I was thinking, which is, you know, I think it's a little bit instructive to, uh, to consider your reasoning process. Why did you come up with this move? I was still thinking, um, this looks like a Maroxy bind setup, although, uh, white's a couple tempos down, it seems. Um, but in a Maroxy bind, uh, one of the issues is that black doesn't have as much space. And so you often just want to trade pieces off, get rid of a couple minor pieces so that your remaining pieces uh, have squares. And so that's kind of a kind of schematic thinking. Well, first I did the, the uh, calculations of those two lines, the D5 and the 94 line, and they didn't seem to lead anywhere. And then I just was sort of thinking generally about that. And so that kind of schematic thinking uh, led to this decision. But it's, uh, it's a mistake in this particular position. I should have played one of those lines. And also, I guess uh, another lesson I would draw from that little mistake is maybe I shouldn't try so hard to win every game. <laughs> you know, if, I, if uh, the best I can do is, is uh, come out of the opening with, uh, with an even position, I should be um, 
uh, satisfied with that rather than trying to uh, keep all the material on maybe at a slight disadvantage and uh, and uh, and play on with with more material and hope for hope for improvements later um, but this this position leaves me feeling a little bit awkward I guess um, also because I was thinking schematically when I did that trade I didn't didn't really evaluate this position uh, tactically like what what are the next moves going to be um, but notice that um, White has some pressure along this diagonal. I mean, really, I kind of wanted to play the move uh, B6. Now that, now that uh, White's gone for a Roxy bind, one setup that I might play against it would be a Hedgehog. And the Hedgehog would be uh, pawn to B6, bishop to B7. Uh, maybe this pawn goes to D6, and this knight routes around to, uh, say, C5 or E5. Um, and that's a reasonable way to play against the um, Roxy. But uh, he's preventing uh, B6 or... Um, making it a little bit awkward right at this position. Let's see, is this a place? <clears throat> uh, well, the chess engine once again is saying I could play uh, d5 here, but I, I just went with d6. That's also part of this hedgehog setup, and I'm just uh, leaving this uh, b6 idea for the moment. I'm, I'm leaving it there. Maybe he will drop his queen back and I'll be able to play that. Um, but he didn't. He went to bishop d2, logical play, just preparing to castle. And now, um, actually, the chess engine says I could get away with b6 here. And I did think about it. Um, the idea is that after b6, then uh, if he takes, you know, I can uh, bring the rook over here to c1. No, I can't, I can't play that. I'm sorry. I have to trade first. I have to trade first and bring the rook to b8. Sorry, I don't know what I was thinking there for a second. And chase this... Uh, Bishop back, and then um, and then pick up that b pawn, and that would be okay. Say the bishop drops back to d4, and um, and I could take here, and uh, yeah, this would be an all right position for black. I think white's still better, but um, you know, it's it's a okay position. Um, the thing is, when I calculate it, okay, well, well, remember I'm in this position here, so I'm calculating ahead. I'm thinking b6, queen takes, queen takes, bishop takes, rook b8, and um, and I was saying, okay, well, what does white have? And, uh, well, what the other thing white could do, I thought might be interesting, was knight to um, a4, defending the bishop. But actually, that doesn't work at all. Anyway, that, that line with knight a4 defending the bishop left me thinking, oh, I don't have much here. But if we, <laughs> let's go forward again. b6, queen takes, queen takes, bishop takes, rick b8. Um, and then now knight a4 here. Defending the bishop, uh, I can play bishop d7 in this position, and uh, and now he's having trouble defending everything. The the, the knight is hanging immediately, and um, and if it moves, the bishop is hanging. So so knight a4 is really not a move in that position at all. So that was just a uh, a pure miscalculation. I think if I had figured that out correctly, I would have played b6 there. And instead, at this point, I gave up on that idea. Oh, <clears throat> but also let's see one other point about b6 is that um, he's not required to uh, take. And um, he could just play something like rook c1. And after rook c1, um, I don't really want to play bishop b7 because then he can take. I don't have this rook b8 idea. So it kind of prevents me from playing this setup that I want anyway. So uh, so after, after a lot of thought, I went with bishop d7. And I'm going to get the bishop on the diagonal by playing bishop to c6 in a move or two. He castles here. I went rook b8. I was thinking also I could uh, get in the move uh, b5 maybe. It might be interesting. And uh, he clamps down on that with uh, a4. So I went with bishop c6. So I've got the bishop on this diagonal. I didn't didn't get my um, b6 move in. Although I could play b6 now because I have the uh, the queen and the rook lined up. But I don't really need to play it at this point. The, the idea of b6 was to open up the b7 square for the bishop, and now I've got the bishop on this diagonal um, via d7. So it seems to be all right here. Although um, <clears throat> uh, white has maintained that slight edge that I talked about uh, ever since I did the exchange on d4. White's, white's playing uh, good moves and, and keeping that slight advantage. Let's see, right, white went uh, rook f, rook f to d1 here. I uh, went queen to a5, which was an okay move. But uh, he plays this move queen d2, and this is uh, introduces some tactical ideas in the position. 
and um, and the main idea here is actually knight to uh, d5. If you haven't seen this trick before, it's it's very useful. Um, say if I did a, a nothing move, <clears throat> if I moved the rook to the side or something. Oh well, let's 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 show the idea with with some kind of logical move. I could try. The the idea is that this bishop goes off with check. So I could try defending the bishop, for example, by playing rook f to e8. And then he comes in with knight d5. And this is the tactic. Uh, my queen is loose here. It's hanging. And, um, you know, if I drop back, he can trade off and, and uh, at least uh, win the bishop pair. And uh, if I take the queen first, then he doesn't take back right away, but he takes his bishop off with check and then takes the queen. So rook fe1 defends the bishop. If I hadn't played that move, I would, I would actually be losing a piece there. Um, but uh, but it results, rook fe1 actually results, if you follow through that sequence, the final position is pretty good for uh, for um, white. White has uh, got the bishop pair and still has pressure against my backwards pawn here and has eliminated one of the, the key defenders of that backwards d pawn in that bishop on e7. So this is a, a good position for white not one I wanted to play. And um, so I ended up playing queen to um, c7 here. That was a move I played in the game. But, um, well, there was another move here that actually is is uh, quite a bit better, and that's the move queen to b4. Um, and the, the advantage of queen to b4 is that um, it, it's camping on this b4 square and preventing... Um, uh, preventing white from playing pawn to b4 because uh, in fact that was part of my idea of bringing the queen out to a5 when I brought the queen out to a5 I was looking at the b4 square I was kind of preparing the way for the knight to come around like this and hop into c5 so that's um, that would be um, this queen b4 move would be uh, continuing my plan of uh, controlling that b4 square so that's why it would be a good move um, but what about this knight d5 tactic what happens here so uh, this is your first uh, tactical quiz in this video here. What happens if white plays uh, knight to d5 and exposing an attack on my queen? What's the answer there? Okay, uh, pause the video if you want time to think about it. <clears throat> um, if he played knight d5 in this position, then the trick is I can take back with the knight, and the knight defends my queen. So that's why b4 is a good square for the queen and a5 isn't. Because I can take back and defend the queen. So anyway, he can he can grab the knight here, but then I can trade queens. And he doesn't have any moves that happen with uh, tempo, no moves with check. So he has to retake the queen, and then I can do something about my bishop here, which will be under attack from the pawn. So all this is uh, okay for um, black. This leaves that kind of uh, advantage that white had. Ever since knight d4, white has had an advantage. And, um, and this would keep that, that same slight advantage to white. But um, anyway, I didn't see that queen before idea. I didn't like rookie one, rookie eight, which is not that great. That, that increases um, white's advantage quite a bit. So I played queen c7, which is maybe the second best move here after queen b4. But, um, but this retreating move has uh, once again increased white's advantage. So white is, white is significantly better here. So kind of two mistakes. So far, that knight, knight d4 move, knight takes d4, first giving white an advantage, and then this uh, retreating move with my queen uh, increases white's advantage. Okay, so, um, and after queen c7, he immediately clamps down on any of my pawn pushes by playing a5, another uh, good move from white. Let's see, I played knight to d7 here, looking to get into um, the c five square, but now he's got time and he plays uh, b4. So he's got that square under control and I'm just never getting a knight to c5. <laughs> so um, the chess engine says here my best move is actually to move my knight back to f6. So you know your plans have uh, have gone astray when your your best to move is to move your pieces back to where they came from. Um, yeah, I wasn't ready to concede that just yet, so I tried uh, continuing with my knight adventure with knight to e5. He kicks it with f4, and my knight uh, ends up on the g6 square, which is just not as good a square. The, the f6 square is a more active square for the knight, so so this this little maneuver here has worsened my position once again. 
Um, let's see. He went bishop to um, b6 here. Yeah. That was the other thing, you know, in chasing my knight away. Um, well, uh, let me point out one thing. <clears throat> my knight could not stay on this square. So that knight did actually get chased away from the uh, from the uh, d7 square by the threat of uh, pawn to b5 trapping the knight. I had to keep that in mind. So a knight move is necessary here, and that's why knight to f6 is probably the best move. The way I played it, knight e5, f4, knight g6, uh, the knight's just not on as good a square. And now he doesn't push b5 right away, but he throws in this move here, bishop b6, sinking his uh, bishop in uh, to a good square, kicking my queen back. And um, let's see, he played rook rick a to c1 and by this point i began to realize i was in a little bit of trouble because uh you know he's now got um it's not just a matter of having some extra space but now he's got this uh kind of dominating knight uh, bishop here rather on b6 and now it really is my pieces are really uh starting to have trouble finding finding spaces so i tried to bust things up a little bit with the move e5 I mean, even though I was um, a little bit worse here and, and a little bit cramped and my opponent is playing in a good style here, I wasn't, um, I wasn't too concerned at this point because, um, well, my experience in playing against um, uh, Class B players like this, uh, uh, ones that have a very positional kind of style, which my opponent seems to be exhibiting here, um, is that usually uh, you can, uh, <laughs> if you just stay alive long enough, they will usually make some kind of mistake. Because at some point, uh, you know, it's just hard to keep control of a position all the way through the game. So at some point, there's usually some, some move you can play to kind of bust things up, create some tactical complications, and, uh, and get back in the game. And so that's, that's my strategy at this point. I'm keeping the material on. Um, and you'll notice that uh, I still have three minor pieces, and, uh, and the material is all even. It's strictly the uh, white's advantage is strictly in the better placement of his pieces and the, the better space. But uh, anyway, you keep your eyes open, look for those little uh, counter shots, and usually uh, they will show up at some point during the game. And um, so I kind of start with this uh, idea in mind. I, I play um, e5, trying to stir up a little trouble, maybe open a few lines. But he doesn't react immediately to this um, e5 move. First, he kicks my bishop, and uh, I drop my bishop all the way back to e8. The problem with um, this d7 square is that there will be a pin here, and then he can push the c pawn forward. So I had to drop all the way back. I suppose I could have traded first, but but generally my bishop is getting chased back. And this is a bit annoying because this <laughs> traps my rook here on f8, that the rook has no squares. And then he also gets this uh, great square for his knight. That's another reason why, uh, well, that, that's an example of why the knight would have been better placed. My knight would have been better placed on f6 rather than going to g6 like I did during the game. Because here I could have just traded the knight off and now I'm kind of stuck with it. Let's see, he went knight d5, I went uh, queen d7, I'm just trying to... Do a little maneuvering here to free up my pieces, maybe get a rook to the c-file. He went um, bishop to c7 here, um, supported by the knight and uh, harassing my rook. My rook went to c8, and then he played uh, b6, cementing his bishop on that square and continuing in his uh, positional style. But actually, he had a tactical win here. So if you want to see if you can spot a, a good tactic for uh, white in this position, Let's see if you can spot the best move here. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away. He could have um, taken here with check. And after knight takes with check, I take back with the queen. And then he can play bishop takes d6. And he's got the skewer. So he wins a pawn and he wins the exchange. So that would be uh, best play there. And uh, that shows an example of how uh, <clears throat> you can convert an advantage in space and activity to a material advantage. You know, I just have my pieces have been kicked around and put into bad spots, and now this is the time that white should cash in. Uh, but b6 is also a good move and just sort of maintains white's advantage. Let's see, but it allows me to open up a line here. I play e takes f4. He takes now. I maybe spotted the idea at this point. And um, 
I took back with the night and maybe I had night takes in the other line too. Um, and, uh, but still this, this does win some material. Uh, and he has to choose. He could take here or here. Um, he decided to take the F pawn. And then I went, uh, queen e6 here. I wanted to, I'm taking a look at uh, his loose pawns. Well, actually this isn't loose, is it? I'm taking a look at his loose, uh, e pawn here. And, um, yeah, that's not loose either. Sorry. And I guess I'm just trying to activate my queen. Maybe I can bring it over here to the king side. Um, let's see. Instead of queen e6, actually, uh, I could have uh, considered giving up the exchange here. Uh, rook takes c7 is, is one of the better moves here, actually. Pawn takes. And he's still going to win this pawn. But um, so he's, he's just up the exchange here. And... Uh, but it does solve some of my problems, and maybe that's the best way to play this position. I just didn't want to uh, give up material, and basically my, my strategy for <clears throat> surviving and winning these types of positions is to uh, try and keep the material on and, and uh, look for look for mistakes and inaccuracies from my opponent. Anyway, so I went queen e6 here, and um, he played the move uh, rook takes d6. And uh, yeah, I'd seen this one coming. Um, this, is a, this is a good move. But I had an idea here. So after rook takes d6, and my queen has no squares, but I have the move uh, knight to g6, uh, counterattacking his queen. So I was hoping uh, some of these complications might be favorable to me. He just dropped his queen back here. And then I dropped my queen back to e7. And, well, one thing I like about this position, one improvement maybe that I've had, a slight improvement, is that uh, this rook is up occupying the e6 square for the moment. And so his bishop isn't coming there. I just need to get this bishop off the back rank somewhere along this diagonal, and then I can get my rook into the game. So I was thinking, you know, maybe I've kind of wiggled and squirmed and, and gotten out of trouble. Um, he played just c5 here, cementing my um, cementing his uh, rook on the e6 square. And I played the move bishop to c6. So... Um, this is, uh, yeah, bishop to c6 is another mistake. So why don't you find the best move for uh, white here? Okay, pause the video if you want some time to think about it. Um, he uh, found the move here. Uh, this is, uh, he, he missed this tactical idea earlier, but he found a tactical idea here, which is uh, rook takes c6, a very good move. It just gives up the exchange, but these uh, pawns are killer. And, um, and also, this pawn is loose. Um, so the giving up the exchange actually uh, wins the A pawn. I have no way to defend that. And then these pawns are coming through. Um, they're very dangerous. So, uh, uh, so anyway, it's all, it's all good for uh, white. Let's see. Um, so that's why here, instead of playing bishop c6, this is probably my last chance to play uh, rook takes c7. And it's a little better here. Rook takes c7 here. He takes, uh, I take. It looks like this is a position I could survive, although, of course, um, white is better. But now, at least, you know, if I bring the bishop out, I have the queen to support it. Uh, one other idea I had here, perhaps, uh, I didn't think about this during the game. I was, I was uh, happy to get my bishop off the back rank, and I played bishop c6 almost immediately. So I really didn't think long enough on this move. Um, the other idea I could have tried here was knight e5. I did think about this move a little bit. Uh, knight e5, he has to move the queen, say queen c3, and then, then maybe I could get bishop c6, and that might have been a little better. Um, although when I put this on the chess engine, the chess engine says white is still uh, doing very well here with the move rick to d5. Not, not a move I would have thought of, but another way of giving the exchange back, if I take the rook, um, <clears throat> then he takes with the pawn, and, and the, this armada of pawns is uh, is going to win the game for white, basically. So, um, so that's a difficult position. And uh, I played the move bishop c6 a little too quickly, and that was like my uh, third and final mistake. I think it's all uh, downhill from here. So, like I said, he spotted the idea. He took the bishop off, and uh, and then there's no no real defense here. Um, Let's see, it's White's turn. He didn't take on a6 right away. He played um, bishop to d6, harassing my queen. Let's see, I went queen g5. I'd spotted this idea. Queen comes out here to g5. 
to hit his rook with the tempo. This gives me time to save my rook, so I wasn't giving back the exchange, um, or so I thought. But then he plays rook f1, and I can't, I can't actually move this rook away <laughs> because I need it to defend uh, f7. So he can uh, take the exchange any time. Uh, let's see. I played knight e5 now, and uh, he played queen f4. Is another good move, and basically forces an exchange of queens. Because if I move the queen away, then my knight is loose. The knight's hanging. So I have to trade queens or move the knight, and then he can take my queen. So, so this basically forces an endgame, and, uh, and white's just winning this endgame. Let's see. What did I play here? I played rook fe8. Well, at least I can get my rook. <laughs> so I did manage uh, to uh, avoid losing the exchange, although he could have taken it. But he gets uh, b7 in. And I move my rook aside, and now he grabs this pawn over here, which has been hanging all this time, but he's just been waiting for the right time to take it. And you can see that uh, white's going to win with these advanced pawns. In fact, um, let's count the material that happened here. Oh, yeah, yeah, he actually gave up the exchange here. So I'm still up the exchange, but these past pawns are winning over here on the queen side. Let's see, I tried knight d7, you know, maybe giving up a piece up for, uh, in order to stop the pawn. He went um, bishop to c4, he went king to h8. He was threatening to come here with check and pick up the uh, rook. So and I, I couldn't defend the pawn, so I just moved the king away. But uh, he now pushes the a pawn forward. I tried knight takes c5, and um, we're on move 40 here. It's actually safe for him to take the, the knight. I was thinking I would have this trick where I would go here with the rook check and then here and skewer those pieces. Uh, I still wasn't sure it was working because he has these winning uh, past pawns over here, but that's kind of what I was going for. But, uh, well, it turns out after rook d1 check, he can block with his rook, and I don't have time to play rook to c1 to skewer his bishops anyway, or to get behind the pawns. Either way, uh, it's just not working. So he could have just taken my knight. Instead, uh, well, this is move 40. He played b8 queen. And uh, this wins as well, just not, not quite as fast, but he made the, the time control, and that's the important thing. Uh, he, had, he had used up most of his time, so he had to, had to play that move uh, before the time control. Let's see, I took, he takes, I take, and he plays a7. And you might think, um, well, isn't, haven't I survived this somehow? We've got uh, four pawns to four pawns, and the rook and a knight versus a rook and a bishop. All I've done is give up the exchange. And I can blockade this pawn, but uh, of course he can defend the pawn with rook takes f7. And now I played um, knight takes e4, you know, keeping the material balance. And um, there's a really good move that uh, white has in this position. So if you want to look for the best move for white right here, why don't you see if you can spot it. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away now. He found the move, and it was rook to b7. It's a great move because it's threatening this check. And this check just wins um, by queening or winning the rook. And um, so I have to move my king off the back rank. And when I do that, he has bishop d3. <laughs> uh, pinning, <laughs> pinning when winning my knight. I can't get over to defend my knight in time. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, uh, a lost position, and I finally resigned at this point since he had made the time control. Um, let's see, if I don't play knight takes e4, you might think, uh, well, that's the problem, that I played knight takes e4 and set up this skewer. But um, if I play the, the another move here, the, it's like the knight takes e4, by the way, is the top engine choice, so that's how bad the position is. I mean, I could have tried king h7 here, which is uh, one of the other engine choices, maybe the second choice, but he can just push this pawn forward. Let's say I bring my king out here to attack his rook. Pawn goes all the way forward, supported by the bishop to uh, defend his rook. So yeah, this is just a, a winning position for uh, white and a very nice game uh, played by my opponent. Um, so, uh, this was actually my last game of the tournament. What happened was, uh, um, after, after this game, I didn't really sleep that night. This was the second game on, uh, Saturday, and, uh, and it went long. <laughs> it was a long game, so it was late when I went to bed, and, uh, and I just couldn't sleep. I mean, it was a tough, 
loss because uh, my mistakes were kind of small, right? I, there was that knight takes d4 m moment when I took here, giving giving white some kind of slight edge. There was this queen c7 when I retreated the queen, um, and that increased the edge. But um, basically, there was never a moment in all this game where uh, where white slipped up and and gave me an opening. So uh, you know, it's a tough kind of game to uh, to lose. And then bishop c6 was finally the losing move. So those were the three losing moves, uh, the three moves that cost me the game, I, I suppose. And it just was a, a gradual process. Uh, too. So, you know, so it was a long and losing struggle. So it's kind of a tough, a tough loss. Um, and uh, yeah, so I didn't sleep very well or hardly at all that night. And the next morning, um, you know, I, I was faced with the prospect of uh, playing two more games uh, against uh, lower rated players who are probably uh, well motivated and uh, in a sleep deprived state. I just wasn't up for it. So, um, so I withdrew from the tournament. And instead, I went for a walk that day. So that's it for this video. I'm going to do one more video on the series where I sum up uh, the, uh, the results of the tournament overall, talk about how some of my opponents did during the tournament and some of the winners in the other, uh, in the other uh, sections. And then I'll show some uh, pictures from my, uh, from my uh, hike. And uh, I will see you then. Bye.